Well, this morning we're going to look at a familiar person in the Bible, Pontius Pilate. I think we all know why Pilate was a coward, but maybe all of us are not aware of the fact that he was quite a theologian because he asked a couple of questions that by how we respond to them will determine whether we go to heaven or whether we don't. And Pilate also gave us counsel that if we follow the counsel of that heathen Roman governor, there's no way that we can't make it into paradise. So Pilate's quite an interesting character. You know, Desire of Ages, page 83, it says it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. You know, Ellen White, of course, has written many, many books, and of course, many compilations have come from her pen as well. You know, this is one of the most practical things that we find in the spirit of prophecy. And this is something that we can do. And it says we need to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. Because as we contemplate how Jesus trusted his Father, as we contemplate how Jesus treated people, as we contemplate how Jesus was treated by Seventh-day Adventists in the first century, as we see what Jesus did and how he did things, our love for him will be more constant. We will be more deeply imbued with his spirit. And if we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. We need to do that. You know, as I think about Isaiah 64 where it says, for we are all as an unclean thing, Isaiah 64, 6, and all our righteousnesses are as what? Are as filthy rags. So the righteous things that we do are as filthy rags. And Jeremiah 23, verse 6 says, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our what? Righteousness. So if all we have to offer are his filthy rags, but Christ is righteousness, then who do I need to get with to do righteousness? I need to get with Jesus. And Ellen White said we need to be spending a thoughtful hour contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scene. Pilate's background, the sketchy background of this Roman governor has it that Pilate was a soldier in the Roman machine. He became famous for his valor and was given opportunity to take a high position. Pilate chose Judea, knowing that if he succeeded here, the next step could very well be Caesar's throne, if he succeeded here. History tells us that Pilate began, and Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, says that Pilate began governing Judea around 26 AD. And in 36 AD, he ended his stint in Palestine. 
So he was there for basically 10 years. 10 years. Now, of course, we first meet Pilate on that Friday morning in the Judgment Hall. It's very fascinating in the Gospel of John. We read in John chapter 18, verse 28, where it says they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Hall of Judgment. It was early. They themselves, the Seventh-day Adventists of the first century, went not into the Judgment Hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. John 18, 28. Now, folk, if somebody gets upset with me saying that they were Seventh-day Adventists, you say, well, there weren't any Seventh-day Adventists till 1863. Well, think again. What day of the week did Caiaphas and all the Jews, what day of the week did they go to church on? They were seventh day somethings, weren't they? Whose coming were they looking forward to? The Messiah. That made them what? An Adventist. So they were seventh day Adventists. Folk, we're not reading a history lesson this morning. We're all there. We're all there in Pilate's Judgment Hall. Some of us are there for the wrong reasons. Some of us are there to kill an innocent man. Some of us are there because we want to be as close to Christ as we can. Some of us have denied him. Some of us have betrayed him. But we're all there. We're all there. The question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, which one are we? Which one are we? It says the council of the Sanhedrin had come to Pilate to have the sentence confirmed and executed, but these Adventist officials would not enter the Roman judgment hall. According to their ceremonial law, they would be defiled thereby and thus prevented from taking part in the feast of the Passover. In their blindness, they did not see that murderous hatred had defiled their hearts. When the Savior was brought into the judgment hall, Pilate looked upon him with no friendly eyes. The Roman governor had been called from his bedchamber in haste. He determined to do his work as quickly as possible. Notice what was in the heart of the Adventists that came to Pilate's judgment hall. They were blind. They had murderous hatred on their heart. But they couldn't go into Pilate's judgment hall because they were afraid they'd be defiled. Weren't they already defiled? Yes, sir. Folk, we have a problem as Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know if you figured that out yet, but... And I say we. We as Seventh-day Adventists have a problem. See, the Seventh-day Adventists of the first century... On that Friday, that sixth day of the week, that preparation day, at that feast time of the year, they went to Pilate's judgment hall. They couldn't go in because they'd be defiled. Now, what did they do the very next day? What did they do the next day after they crucified Christ? They kept the Sabbath. Can you keep the Sabbath with anger in your heart? Can you keep the Sabbath with lust in your heart? You can't. See, the Bible in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, and Exodus 31, verse 17, or verse 13, it says that the Sabbath is a sign of sanctification. It's a sign of a group of people who have given up on their efforts to be righteous and they're looking to a man who alone can make them righteous. That's what the Sabbath is a sign of. And Desire of Ages says that all those who receive the sign of the Sabbath recognize that it is a sign of God's power to save his people, not in, but from their sins. That's what the Sabbath is a sign of. 
So the Jews, the Adventists in the first century, they didn't keep that Sabbath, folks. And they didn't keep that Passover either because their heart was defiled by sin. Defiled by sin. Desire of Ages, page 724. This is what Pilate saw when Jesus came into the judgment hall. It says, Pilate looked at the men who had Jesus in charge, then his gaze rested searchingly on Jesus. He'd had to deal with all kinds of criminals, but never before had a man bearing marks of such goodness and nobility been brought before him. On his face he saw no sign of guilt, no expression of fear, no boldness or defiance. He saw a man of calm and dignified bearing whose countenance bore not the marks of a criminal, but the signature of heaven. See, now those are the pictures. That's the photo album of the Desire of Ages that Ellen White says we need to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating this man. This man who had on his face marks of goodness and nobility, no sign of guilt, no expression of fear, no boldness or defiance, but a man of calm and dignified bearing. Folk, I want to be like that man. That's who I, I want to be like him. When somebody sees me, I, I want people to see goodness. I want them to see nobility. No sign of fear. No expression of guilt. No boldness or defiance. But somebody who is calm and dignified. I want to be like that. But I can't be because all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So how can I be like that? It's just like what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, but we all with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed, are changed into the same image by the Spirit of the Lord. So if I spend time beholding Christ, seeing what he was like, seeing how he dealt with situations, he can make me like himself. I want to be like him. I don't want to be like Barabbas. I don't want to be like Judas. I want to be like Christ. Pilate starts asking Jesus questions. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, did you say this of yourself or did others tell it thee of me? John 18. Am I a Jew? Pilate answered. Pilate was convicted. Christ said, are you asking me because you're under conviction that he was the son, that I'm the sent of God, Jesus said? Pilate said, I'm not a Jew. You were brought before me by your own nation. So Pilate skirted the conviction that came upon his heart. He skirted it. He pushed it away from himself. Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? There's that first question of that Roman theologian. He said, What is truth? Folk, by how we understand what is truth, it's going to determine a long way where we end up in this great controversy. If 
we think that if our truth is that salvation is found in an organization, if we think that our salvation is found in keeping a day, if our salvation is found in things that we have manufactured, if we think that's where salvation is found, if that is our truth, then we're going to be in trouble. Jesus said in John 14, what did he say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus said he was the truth. See, now we can spend a lot of time reading the newspaper, and we can spend a lot of time watching the television news, and we can listen to the radio news, but that's not truth. That's not truth. Jesus is the truth. So, folk, we've got to focus on the truth. Because we're going to be changed into whatever it is that we're munching on. Whatever we're assimilating into our lives, that's going to change us, friend. Whatever it is, it's going to change us. And Christ said, I'm the truth. So if we want to be following the truth, we've got to be spending time with Him. Amen. Beholding Him. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. So what happens? The Bible is the truth. So what happens if somebody comes along, like, say the, um, now, I apologize, well, I don't apologize. I take that back. I do not apologize for naming names. Okay, I do not apologize. What do we do if 3ABN, and one of the pastors on 3ABN, that obviously is getting the encouragement and support from the higher-ups at 3ABN, a man by the name of John Lomacain, gets on 3ABN and says, the Antichrist today is the devil. Now what do we do with that? The Bible is very clear on who the Antichrist power is. Is it not? In Daniel chapter 7, the little horn power. In Revelation chapter 13, the first beast that comes out of the sea. The man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The harlot of Revelation chapter 17. Is the Bible not clear on who the Antichrist is? So if John Lomacain or any other comes along, and I'm going to name a few other names before we get finished with this little point. If they come along and say, well, it's the devil. So what do we do with that? Is that now the truth? Does the truth change? The truth doesn't change, folks. And the Bible is the truth. The man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it doesn't matter who says, and it doesn't matter how they say it, if they're standing on their head and their socks are purple, it doesn't make any difference, friend. Truth is still the truth. Now what happens if Ted Wilson in writing to people, talking about... He was asked a question recently if there were Jesuits that were in high positions in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Now, I was just kicked off of going out to speak at a camp meeting in Southern California because I said there were. Well, Ted Wilson was asked that question, and he said, you know we shouldn't be thinking about or focusing on anything like that. There aren't any. What we need to focus on is that we keep the Sabbath, we believe that Jesus is coming, 
uh, we believe in health, and we believe in being kind to our neighbors. Now, can we agree with all of those things, except for the part about there being Jesuits in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? Can we agree with all those other things that he said? Of course we can. But you know, when Ted Wilson is asked, who is the Antichrist today? For some reason, he, he and John Lomacain have been reading the same material. He says it's the devil too. Now, folk, now, folk, let me ask you something. Does your Bible in the third angel's message say, if any man worship the devil and his image? The beast. And who is that beast of Revelation 14, verse 9? Who is it? Can you say that just a little bit? Loud? I cleaned my ears this morning. I used the Q-tips. Who is the beast of Revelation 14? The papacy. The papacy. You say, Bill, that, that's not very politically correct today. Well, let me ask you something. Did the truth change? No. Folk, we're not here to be politically correct. Amen. Pilate was... And if you're trying to be politically correct today, then you're sitting with Pilate. It's that simple. It's that simple. You say, Bill, I get really uncomfortable with that because a lot of people don't like what you're saying. You know what, folk? I don't care. Amen. I don't care. We have a message. Amen. It's still the truth. Amen. And the last that I saw, the truth is going through to paradise. Amen. And the truth will go through with us or without us. Amen. We have a choice to make. Pilate had a choice to make. Are we going to play, play politics? Are we going to play to get along? Or are we going to take a stand? You know, I was talking with a gentleman last night. He's a religious liberty leader up in Pennsylvania. He has a, one of those um, phone prayer line groups. And he said... Um, he said, I was asked to take part in a march in Pennsylvania, the 23rd of March, to march with Roman Catholics, apostate Protestants, and, nom and nominal Adventists. We're all going to be part of this great march to oppose the president's stand where he made it necessary for there to be contraceptives with his new health care plan, you know, with that health care plan. And the conference called this, or wrote to this man and said, we need a definitive response from you. Are you going to be in the march or not? You know what he said? That's exactly what he said, man. Amen. Amen, that's what he said. He said, I will not be marching in anything that has apostate evangelical people and Roman Catholics. I'm not going to be marching with them. I'm not going to be going shoulder to shoulder with apostate religious organizations because he said, if I do it now, why not right down the road? I said, praise God. Amen. You know what, friends? He probably is the only one who's not marching. The Pennsylvania Conference will be in the march. Why? Because they want to play. They're going to play with Rome and apostate Protestantism. Folk, we've got decisions to make. Are we going to stand on truth 
are we going to play? What are you going to do? Pilate wanted to play. Pilate wanted to play. God's law is the truth. That's what's on trial in our world today. Christ was on trial 2,000 years ago, but today it's God's law. What are we going to do with God's law? Especially that fourth commandment. What are we going to do with it? Pilate was too busy. He asked the question of Christ. He didn't wait for an answer. A golden opportunity passed him by. It would have made all the difference. Christ affirmed that his word was in itself a key which would unlock the mystery to those who were prepared to receive it. It had a self-commending power. This was the secret of the spread of his kingdom of truth. He desired Pilate to understand that only by receiving and appropriating truth could his ruined nature be reconstructed. Pilate said, what is truth? But he was too busy to wait for an answer. Are we too busy? Are we too busy? You know, for so many of us, our time with God in the morning is when we sit down to eat breakfast. And we give a 10 to 15 second prayer. You know, something like, Dear Lord, please bless the missionaries over in Africa and in the Far East. And, um, you know, thanks for the food and please be with us throughout this day. Amen. Folk, if, if that... If that is the amount of time that we have for Christ, have we plugged in to the power of God? No, we haven't. Basically what we have done is, is that we have slapped Christ, just as they did in Caiaphas' judgment hall, just as they did in Pilate's hall, just as they did in Herod's hall, we have slapped him across the face and said, I don't have time for you. I am too busy. And then, to silence the guilt that we feel because we know we have just plucked some of Christ's beard from his face and said, I don't have time. Then we ease the guilt because we say, you know, don't worry, I, I'm making money and I'll be sure to put money in the till this Sabbath. Is that what he wanted? And then we say, oh, but, you know, as I sat down there to eat breakfast this morning, I, I had a vegetarian meal. I, I ate my apple and my, my banana and, and I had my cereal and I didn't even put cow's milk on it. It was soy milk. <laughs> See, and we, mollif we we feel good about it. Folk, is that what Christ wanted? No, he wants me. He wants you. He wants us to get to know him, what he's like. So that we can then learn what we're like. Because that's our greatest problem. Our greatest problem is we don't know what we're like. Because doesn't Laodicea say, I am rich. I am increased with goods. I don't need anything. That's our greatest problem, folk. You know, I was reading a book just recently and, and the author said, our greatest need is that we recognize our great need. And until we do, we'll, we, we'll just be slapping Jesus Christ till our dying day.
know, I think the hardest thing as a parent, as I see my children grow up, I crave time. I crave time when I can be with them. I crave it. I loved being with them when they were little, as they grew older. But now as they've grown older and my, my son is out of the house, when he comes home, I crave time. It means so much to a dad to be with their children. At least with this dad it does. And folk, if, if a miserable, wretched, carnal, despicable person as I, selfish, greedy person as I, loves to be with their children, how much more? How much more does God long for us to get on our knees and talk to Him? Just to talk to Him. Not, not to make Him out to be, you know, the, the syrupy, sweet, fuddy-duddy that gives us every... No! That we tell Him what's going on in our lives. He wants to know us so bad. So bad. Jesus said in John 17, 3, he said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You know, those out there that want to play the no Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit's not a, the third person of the Godhead, which is utter bunk. Folk, they quote John 17, 3, and they miss the whole issue. The whole issue is, is that Jesus wants us to spend time with him. So we can get to know him. And he can get to know us. Sure, he knows everything about us. But he wants us to get to know us. Desire of Ages 7.26 Standing behind Pilate in view of all in the court, Christ heard the abuse. But to all the false charges against him, he answered not a word. His whole bearing gave evidence of conscious innocence. He stood unmoved by the fury of the waves that beat about him. It was as if the heavy surges of wrath rising higher and higher like the waves of the boisterous ocean broke about him, but did not touch him. He stood silent, but his silence was eloquence, was as a light shining from the inner to the outer man. You know, folk, times are marching on. And someday soon, as Matthew 24, as Luke 21 tell us, Matthew chapter 10, it says, but when they deliver you up, see, folk, us here in this room today, God wants, is calling us to a greater stage. And someday, folk, the, the eyes of CNN and the, the print of USA Today, it's not going to be on Syria or Iran or Barack Obama or Newt Gingrich or Mitt Romney, you know who it's going to be on? It's going to be on us. We're going to be called to those stages, friend. And everything that we believe is going to be challenged, it's going to be shredded, and so will we be shredded in every way. You say, oh, Bill, that's discouraging. No, friend, that's reality. That's reality. So how, how, when people are ripping me to shreds, saying every possible thing they could to destroy me as a person, and they're destroying everything 
that I believe as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. How? How can I stand? How can you, how can we stand, friends? The same way Jesus did. The same way Christ did. And how was it that he could stand unmoved by the fury of the waves that beat upon him? How was it that those things could break about him but did not touch him? How could that be? Because Christ was in communion with his Father. John the Baptist, we're told in Desire of Ages, is that he could stand erect and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs. Why? Because he had bowed low before the King of Kings. That's how he did it. Friend, don't you want to stand fearless? dignified, noble in the presence of Congress and CNN? Don't you want to stand fearless, friend? I do. I do. If that's how John the Baptist did it, John the Baptist recognized that he was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what John the Baptist recognized. Because he did, Christ possessed his soul. I want that. Don't you want that, friends? I want that. Pilate made a fatal mistake. He knew that Christ had done nothing wrong. He knew that Christ was without fault. He knew he was innocent. Pilate called the Adventist leaders together and he said, You've brought this man to me as one that perverteth the people. Behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Do you know what was involved in chastisement? The Romans would take these whips and attached to the whips would be broken pieces of glass and rock. And somehow they attached them to these whips. And then the soldiers would flick that whip and it would wrap around the person's upper torso, stomach, chest area. And folk, then the soldier would pull it back. And those jagged pieces of glass and rock would literally rip the person's body. Now that's what Pilate said he would do to an innocent man. When the Adventist leadership heard that, they said, we've got him now. If Pilate will do that to an innocent man that he knows is without fault, if we push the issue, Jesus is ours. How often, folk, we are confronted with what we know is true. But we don't say anything. We don't stand up. We're silent. We say, we need to pray. No, 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 we don't. We need to stand up and say something. Yeah. 
You know, on this radio program I was on, I'm still on it right now. We talked about spiritual formation in Seventh-day Adventism, that it was brought in in 2001 by a committee at the General Conference. On that committee was the then President Jan Paulson, uh, a vice president at that time, Ted Wilson, who is now the General Conference president, a uh, John Dibdahl, who is the current president at Walla Walla College out in Washington State. They voted for spiritual formation to be brought in to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, that it be taught to all the leaders in Seventh-day Adventism. Well, I did some research to find out where does spiritual formation come from? Well, folk, it is an offshoot of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. So it came from the Jesuit order. And Malachi Martin made it very clear that anybody who is taught in spiritual formation becomes an obedient servant of the Pope. Of the Pope. So brought into the Seventh-day Adventist denomination 11 years ago was spiritual formation that would be taught to the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist organization that would make the leadership obedient servants of the Pope. Now you say, I don't know where you got that information. Well, you know, go back and read Rick Howard's book, a Seventh-day Adventist minister for over 30 years, The Omega Rebellion. He'll tell you that spiritual formation was brought in in 2001. It's on page 136 of his book. Then if you go to Lewis Walton's book called Omega 2, and Lewis Walton is as fundamental and solid a Seventh-day Adventist as you will find, on page 150 of his book, Lewis Walton says, quotes Malachi Martin, that if you are involved in spiritual formation, you will become an obedient servant of the Pope. So we talked about that on the air, and we talked about inappropriate music in the house of God. We talked about other foolishness like the New International Perversion and other things. And when we got done, and I told the people, I said, folk, if this is going on in the church where you are attending, I said, you need to stand up and say something. You need to protest. And this gentleman came on after in the Q&A and he said, you know, from all that I heard tonight, this is a call to prayer. No, it's not a call to prayer. It's a call to do something. And to stop allowing garbage in the house of God. That's what it is, friends. Well, you know, last week I was on another radio program and we talked about the Alpha and Omega of apostasy. And I told the people, I said, now let me tell you, if this is going on, and you're seeing doctrine in your church just being thrown in the dust, I said, you need to go to the leaders of that church and say, I will not tolerate this in a Seventh-day Adventist church. This is garbage, and it needs to be stopped. And I said, if it's not stopped, then you need to go back to the leadership of that church and say, until this garbage is stopped, I will not put another penny. I will not put another nickel in the till until something is done about this garbage. In the Q&A, a lady came on and she said, she said, you know, the, the main speaker tonight, he's very divisive. And, and he's very critical. And we need to pray. 
And I, and I said over the air, I said, ma'am, who, who are you saying is divisive and critical? Who are you talking about? She said, well, I'm talking about you. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, and you know what? You are a coward, and I'm talking about you. <laughs> Folks, this idea, this idea that we're going to sit back and we're going to continue to, to support garbage and we're going to continue to support apostasy and in the meantime, we're going to pray in silence that something will happen, that God will steer the ship aright. Get a life. It's not going to happen, friends. It's not going to happen. It's time. No, it's not time. It's past time. We should be protesting. Protesting. And if we're not, then we're allowing our conscience to be destroyed just as Pilate's was when he cowardly said, I know that's true. I know that's right. I know he's innocent, but I'm going to rip his torso to shreds anyway. That's being a coward. That's being a coward. If we're listening to the new international perversion, if we're singing and swaying and celebrating, if we're listening to spiritual formation, if we're listening to that the devil is the Antichrist, and we're not saying anything? That's being a coward, friends. That's being a coward. And until we get on our knees and bow low before Jesus Christ and realize what He has done for us and what He is calling us to do, will continue to be a coward. The reason Pilate sent Jesus to Herod was because Pilate heard that he was from Galilee. So Pilate hoped to shirk the responsibility, pass it off on somebody else. You know, this idea, friends, that I'm going to trust the elder to do it, or I'm going to trust the pastor, or I'm going to trust this person or that person. Folk, when there's a duty to be had, it's not somebody else's responsibility, it's our responsibility. This idea that, you know, on the air, when people hear about the apostasy in Advent, they say, oh, well, I, I just know that the Lord is going to straighten this... The Lord has put you there to straighten it out. And until we do something, He's not going to do anything. So Pilate wanted to get the responsibility away from himself. It was everybody else's you know, let somebody else do it, not me. I don't want to get involved. That's how we are. We don't want to get involved. As a result, Pilate and Herod became friends. Became friends. Killed an innocent man, but they became friends. Crucified the truth, but they became friends. We do the same thing, don't we? In order to keep a friendship, somebody that's leading us down a wrong path, in order to save the friendship, we sacrifice what is right and go down the path with them. 
Could be in a lot of different areas too, couldn't it? Christ's way points this way and our friends point that way. Pilate went that way. Which way are we going? Pilate had sacrificed his conscience. Pilate knew what the right thing was to do. It was clear. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew he was true. Tried to get Herod involved so they could become buddies, which they did. Jesus had been scourged at least once at this point. His upper torso looked like ribbons, bleeding, had fainted at least once. And Christ was praying for Pilate. In answer to Christ's prayer, the wife of Pilate had been visited by an angel from heaven. In a dream, she had beheld the Savior and conversed with him. Pilate's wife was not a Jew, but as she looked upon Jesus in her dream, she had no doubt of his character and mission. She knew him to be the Prince of God. She saw him on trial in the judgment hall. She saw the hands tightly bound. She saw Herod and his soldiers doing their dreadful work. She heard the priests and rulers filled with envy and malice. She heard the words, we have a law and by our law he ought to die. She saw Pilate give Jesus to the scourging after he had declared, I find no fault in him. She heard the condemnation pronounced by Pilate and saw him give Christ up to his murderers. She saw the cross uplifted on Calvary. She saw the earth wrapped in darkness, heard the mysterious cry, it's finished. She saw Christ seated upon the great white cloud while the earth reeled in space. His murderers fled from the presence of his glory. The cry of horror she awoke and at once wrote to Pilate words of warning, have thou nothing to do with that just man for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Jesus was praying for him. So Pilate tried to figure out a scheme. Pilate knew the right thing to do. But he was afraid. He was afraid that it might sacrifice his job. He was afraid of his position and his power. He was afraid of that. He knew if he released Jesus that the Jews would never forgive him for it. So he had to hold on to his job. He just couldn't let it go. So he figured out a scheme because at Passover time, one prisoner was to be released. And so Pilate thought, who is the worst prisoner that we have down in the hold? And he said, oh yes, yeah, that, that Barabbas, that murderer, that thief, that guy who's trying to overthrow the Romans. He's the worst prisoner we've got. And if I bring him forth and set him side to side with Christ, I'm sure, I'm sure that the Jews, I'm sure the Adventists will say, give us Christ. And so Pilate brings Barabbas from the prison, sets him next to Christ. Jesus' torso is bleeding almost fainting. He's got a th crown of thorns on his head. And P 
Pilate says, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? How would you answer? How would I answer that question? Am I today doing things in my life that I know are not right? But I'm saying as young people often would say in my class at school when I was teaching, when the Spirit of God would be in that room and would be speaking to their hearts. I remember two young men, handsome eighth grade boys. The girls loved them. They knew that their folks had good jobs, family occupations, so the boys would have good jobs in the future. They had everything they could imagine. And I remember taking them out one day and they said, Mr. Hughes, the truth that has been presented in Bible class has been so clear. God's word is true. And I said, are you boys ready to surrender and and let Jesus be the Lord of your lives? They said, when the Sunday law comes, when the Sunday law comes, we'll turn around and we'll follow Jesus then. I said, boys, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. When the Spirit of God speaks to our heart today, when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Folk, if there's something we're doing today that we know is wrong, we've got to give it to Christ and say, Lord, this is killing me. This is destroying me. I'm sacrificing you for this. Save me. From myself. Save me from my greatest enemy. That's me. This morning, we're all answering that question. We all are. What shall I then do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And you and me and the Holy Spirit that is here this morning, he knows and we know how we are answering that question this morning. What would we do with Jesus this morning? Does he get in the way of your ambition, your job? Does he keep you from some cherished friend that you can't live without? What shall I do then with Jesus? Pilate was killing himself. And maybe some of us today are doing the same thing. If we're choosing our way, we're killing ourselves. He had scourged an innocent man. His wife told him to have nothing to do with Jesus. He figured the custom of releasing a prisoner would work, but it failed. He tried everything, but doing the right thing and letting the chips fall as they would. He knew if he crossed the Jews, he'd lose his job. He was at a crossroads. 
Seventh-day Adventists simply put the nail in the coffin. They said, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Pilate wasn't dumb. He wasn't dumb. He knew exactly what the Adventists meant by that. They meant, if you let this guy go, we will relentlessly pursue you till we enter the courts of Caesar in Rome and have you destroyed. It's exactly what they meant, and he knew it. And so he had a decision to make. Would he save his job? Or would he save an innocent man? Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold, behold the man. Pilate decided what he would do with Jesus. The final chapters in our story have not yet been told. But we're making decisions today just as Pilate did. Pilate gave us the solution. He said, Behold the man. Behold the man. Spend time with the man. Submit your life to the man. Unfortunately, Pilate didn't do that either. Will we heed the words of Pilate and behold the man? Or will we snub him because he keeps us from some cherished job, some coveted person, or some goal? I pray that our decision today will be to crown him. To crown him now as the king of our being. For now and for eternity.